Welcome to Central Line, the AHA podcast. This is the official podcast of the American Animal Hospital Association, dedicated to simplifying the journey towards excellence in veterinary medicine for every member of the veterinary team. Here's your host, Dr. Katie Berlin. Hi, welcome back to Central Line. I'm your host, Dr. Katie Berlin, and I'm here with two guests today. They are both distinguished members, uh, actually a task force chair and a task force member for the 2022 AAFP AHA Antimicrobial Stewardship Guidelines. And I'm really excited to talk about a topic that maybe isn't always like what everyone considers the most exciting, sexy topic, antimicrobial stewardship. But it is, I think, actually really, really cool. And I think you'll think so, too, after hearing these two speak about it. So Aaron Fry and Jennifer Granick, welcome to Central Line. Thanks. thanks. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. So before we get going, I would love for both of you doctors to let us know what's going on in your lives, how you got to be here, and um, why you're here talking to me today. Aaron, you want to go first? Oh, sure. So I'm Dr. Aaron Fry, and I currently work at um, NC State's College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, I do a combination of things. I work in our primary care practice. I teach public health and epidemiology, and then I have a research focus on antimicrobial use and stewardship. Um, before becoming uh, in, into academia, <laughs> I was in private practice for 15 years, um, working with cats and dogs in AHA practices. So I'm, um, and I've been on different AHA leadership committees, and I currently represent AHA to the AVMA Committee on Antimicrobials. So it's kind of been a combination of having been in private practice, seeing resistant infections, trying to figure out what to do, following AHA guidelines, and then kind of putting it all together and being on this side, the teaching side, and really trying to um, see what works with teaching students and working with clients and really putting that all together to, to serve the profession. This is a really hard topic. It can be challenging to have this conversation with clients, but I'm really confident that we can we can do it. We're doing better than we were, and I think we're, we're making strides in the right direction. So that's what got me involved in this in this task force. Optimism. I like that. That's what we need. <laughs> Empowerment. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jen, your turn. Uh, yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm uh, Dr. Jen Granick. I am a faculty at the University of Minnesota College of Vet Med. I'm a small animal internal medicine specialist. And um, and though my I have a PhD in, in um, comparative pathology with a focus on um, immunology, but my passion really is, um, though I'm not formally trained in epidemiology, um, all of the work that um, uh, Aaron was talking about. So I, I too do research on antibiotic use in cats and dogs and uh, also focus in the hospital and um, in outreach on antimicrobial stewardship. And, uh, you know, I'm really passionate about it because um, this is a this is an issue that I see in in my patients on a daily basis, and so um, it just became a really obvious area of, of focus because uh, the cool thing about antimicrobial stewardship is that it's an actionable um, thing that every single prescriber can do to help uh, decrease sort of this really scary onset of antimicrobial resistance that we're seeing in our patients. So it's just, it's tangible for everybody. And the other cool thing about it is that probably whether you know it or not, all practitioners are are, are already doing some aspect of stewardship. So um, so really just kind of changing the focus and, and the intention um, in small ways can do a lot. So I, I think, I think, um, yeah, it's probably out of mind for most folks, but um, not necessarily out of practice. <laughs> I really like that. I like the idea that this is something that it's not just we're saying like you have to change everything you do. It's saying like these are the things you're already doing and let's try to do a little bit more and we can all right. do that. It makes it a little bit less intimidating and less of like a a culture shift and more of just a expansion of something that is already second nature. I really like that concept. 
Well, thank you both for being here. Um, and before, also before we um, get into all of the questions that I have for the two of you about antimicrobials, um, I would like to know what breed of dog or cat I need to be more inclusive. Would you be? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a great question. Um, it's actually a question that we we ask. Um, I've asked in interviews for technicians at our practice. Is uh, like, what would your cage card say? Um, oh, but, I love that. Um, <laughs> oh my god, I'm totally feeling that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I thought about it. Actually, took a couple of online quizzes. So I said, what would I be? But actually, in the end. Um, I love cats, and so I would say that I would identify with Maine Coon cats. Um, they are yes. they are tall with long hair. They are very social. They love to be around people. They love to be in different environments. They're confident, and um, yeah. So I think I would be a Maine Coon cat if I had to I be a breed that. of cat. Who doesn't love a Maine Coon? <laughs> oh my gosh, I I'm actually in love with one of my Maine Coon cat patients. Like I get Aww. like butterflies when I see him. I love him. So much. <laughs> That's how I know I'm with my people. <laughs> um, I, I took, I took a online quiz that um, Aaron actually provided <laughs> uh, to see what sort of dog I am. I kind of knew it in my heart already, but it was confirmed that I am a golden retriever, you know, like pr- friendly, cuddly, like kind of inherently lazy, but but can be like excitable at times, like really loyal, <laughs> a little bit crazy, um, nutty, like in a good way. Um, mm. Yeah, just kind of like, hey guys, what do you want to do? <laughs> you know, kind of up for anything, like happy to be on the couch, happy to go for, you know, a canoe ride. Like, yeah. Love it. I, I mean, who doesn't love a golden? So, yeah, that's fantastic. I was a mutt on the quiz that Aaron sent, um, which is actually accurate. I am, in fact, a hybrid. But also, um, it, it said I was flexible. And I think very, depending on who you talk to, they would either laugh or be like, yeah, that's true. And I'm not going to tell you what the people closest to me would do. <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, thank you. I just learned so much about people with that question. Um, but I love the cage card one, and I'm totally going to steal that for future podcasts. I will give you credit. Okay. So why are we talking about this? Um, you were both on the task force for this uh, collaborative guidelines with the AAFP and AHA. And, um, you know, these guidelines, they're shorter than a lot of the guidelines that we put out, you know, that could be like 20 some pages. These are shorter. And they're sort of more like bullet point, like here are the things that you can do. And I just think that's so great. They're so actionable and not judgmental. They're just like stating what you feel is most important that we all can do right now. What did it mean to you to be on these guidelines? What was that experience like? Well, I would like jump in and say what sort of building on what Jen said is there's this, I think there's a general feeling maybe that Um, doing antimicrobial stewardship, you're going to have to start something new. But I think what the guidelines do is they really, it's a way to really look through and say, oh, I'm already doing that. My team is doing this. Or, you know, it's to really celebrate what you're already doing. And I think maybe that can make it less intimidating. Um, The idea of starting, like, we're not saying start a stewardship program. I mean, if you want to do that and you have the resources to do that, then great. And I think it builds on um, a lot of the other guidelines that AHA has, the biosecurity guidelines. So, you know, infection control program, it really integrates in what other things um, we talk about preventive care, which that, fa- you know, that feeds right into the canine and feline vaccine guidelines, our lifestyle recommendations. And to me, Again, I mentioned I worked in private practice for 15 years, and then at the vet school, we're an AHA practice as well at the at the vet school. As an associate at a practice, you know, when you have a discussion about what are we going to do or what are our standards of care going to be or what are our policies going to be, you know, I just found myself and my colleagues always falling back on, well, what does AHA say? What, you know, what what experts has, has AHA brought together to give us the standard of care and pull, because practitioners, we don't have, you don't have time in private practice to read 50 papers and to look at all the things. You really rely on AHA to, to do that work for you and then have it 
in one place. So um, the the guidelines that were out before this, um, it had been a few years since then been updated. And there's been a lot of new things done and a lot of new work done. I think one of the big things that we wanted to address here was that the previous ones were called judicious use. And really the focus, um, we wanted to expand the focus from not just thinking about that time, like you have an animal in front of you and you're choosing, are you going to use an antibiotic or not? But really, again, to say it's part of this kind of global thing that happens at your practice. So the vaccines that you recommend, um, you know, the, the nutrition that you advise clients to do, all of those things are part um, of stewardship. So really reframing it in terms of this, you know, bigger picture rather than just that moment to emphasize how important all that that is. Um yeah, and really to get the, the resources in the hands of, of doctors, right, who can't, it, you're just busy. <laughs> you need, you, this is the work we do is to get those sort of high level things out. And then if you want to read the resources, that's why you put a lot of references in there for people who really want to dig in deep and, and figure out the details. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with everything Aaron said. I, I, I I love that the guidelines are, as you said, they're they're kind of they're bullet points. Um, you know, no one no one has time these <laughs> these days to like read through, um, uh, you know, pages and pages of of recommendations, and 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 that's intimidating. And I think that the the main message in these guidelines is that um, you're probably doing a lot of this already, um, and but I think everyone can probably find like one action item just to start with to say you know what I'm doing a lot of these things but this thing I'm not really focusing on maybe we'll examine that for our practice and I think that the guidelines are presented in a way that yeah they're accessible and if you you know pick one thing and 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 focus on that and then you know build upon that momentum I think small steady change is really impactful and and what's really cool is that you you already have probably a lot of momentum in your clinic from some of these things that you're doing, like Aaron mentioned, infection control, um, preventative care. Um, so I, I, I think um, another, as Aaron said, there's a lot of resources that are referenced in the guidelines and and they're great resources. And even if you don't, you know, dive into all of them, um, just looking at that reference risk list will provide some, I think, um, imp- valuable information. So I recently um, gave a lecture at the the AVMA conference and um, asked how many folks were familiar with the International Society for Companion Animal Infectious Disease um, antimicrobial prescribing guidelines that are out there for urinary tract infections, um, respiratory infections, and um, canine superficial um folliculitis. And I was surprised how few people were aware of them, but a lot of kind of the the nuts and bolts from those are kind of embedded in these AHA guidelines too. So I think it's, um, the other thing I appreciated about that is, is it was, is, you know, sort of simplifying some of that and making it available to everybody in, in, again, a really accessible way. Yeah, I really love that about these. And I also love that, like, you know, we have hopefully members of the veterinary team listening to this who aren't vets um, and maybe don't have as much background in, you know, learning about infectious disease and how to treat it, but they're involved in the care of patients for sure and in communicating with clients who are used to a certain treatment being given to their pets. And so I love that these guidelines are accessible to the whole team. Like you could hand this document to anybody on your team and they, they could probably read it, understand it and be like, oh, that's something that I could keep in mind when I'm communicating with clients who ask me certain questions, um, or this is why that doctor does things a slightly different way than I've seen before. And um, I really love that uh, because we need everybody on the team, and we'll talk about that more um, in a minute, but it, antimicrobial stewardship can't just be one person in the practice, right? So it's definitely um, it's great to have a document that helps make it look so much simpler. You know, we know it's not easy, but it 
It doesn't have to be so right. complicated. And really, like when I was reading the document, <laughs> straightforward. There we go. Yeah. And when I was reading the document, you know, I was thinking, <laughs> I'm not in practice right now. But looking at the document, I was thinking, I was in practice very recently, and I was thinking, okay, I already do most of these things, but do I do them enough? And do I have this conversation every time? And the answer, of course, is no. You know, I think we, the three of us talked about this previously, we said, you know, this is something that you need to think about every case, every time, and maybe you'll end up prescribing antibiotics, but thinking about it, having the conversation is always appropriate. And I definitely have not always done that. Um, So that alone is just helpful. Do you feel like, do you both feel like we've made progress in this area? I know, um, Erin, you mentioned that we, you think we're doing better. Um, Do you think our progress has been pretty, like, as we know more, we do better? Or do you feel like we are sort of reaching a point where we have to, like, make a conscious decision to change how we handle these drugs? Gosh, I feel like both of those things are true. Yeah. You know, so I, I think we, we, you know, it's, there is some urgency in this, you know, in there are some estimates now this isn't in, in humans but that by 2050 untreatable um, microbial infections will be the number one cause of death worldwide so uh, you know and we we don't have those statistics for our companion animals but they live in our shared environment right so mm-hmm. i think um, we use a lot of the same drugs um, or same classes of drugs you know we treat treating similar conditions so it's you know i think there, there's some urgency but i also think that we've made progress. Actually, out of um, NCSU, there was a recent paper in JAVMA looking at prescribing um, over time for UTIs, and they looked at like over a hundred or a thousand clinics. This was like Block and colleagues, and um, from 2010 to 2019, and the International Society for Companion Animal Infectious Disease, or ISCADE, guidelines, the first version came out in 2011. And they found in this study that there was a like a, something like a 13% increase in utilization for, of amoxicillin for UTIs, um, so lower urinary tract infections, um, after those guidelines came out. Like each year, there was this, this increase, and um, and that's listed in those guidelines as a first line agent for for UTIs, which is which is great um, because if we uh, use other antimicrobials like fluoroquinolones, for instance, you know, there's a greater risk of the development of antimicrobial resistance because with those drugs, once resistance develops, you typically have multi-drug resistance. Um, You have resistance to multiple classes of antibiotics that kind of come along for the ride with the, um, on the plasmid that, that confers um, fluoroquinolone resistance. So the, this, increased utilization of amoxicillin is like a, 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 a lovely trend. It's a fabulous trend, and, you know. Um, so, and so I think that that proves that the veterinary community, you know, wants to be evidence-based, wants to embrace best practices. And, and, you know, of course, all of us just want to do what's best for our patients. So I think, you know, that paper shows that there is progress. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm sure that if we looked in other areas, we're likely to see the same and hopefully in the future that that um, trend will continue. Yeah, I think another thing that I've um, noticed is this, this idea of using topical drugs for um, skin infections. And that, I mean, when that was sort of first came out as a thing and that was trying, you know, that, that also was, you know, guidelines in 2014 and that was, you know, a huge culture change. And it was just, what do you mean? Just, you know, apply a, uh, you know, do a bleach rinse or I I can't possibly do this. Well, now it's very standard for animal, for like topicals has become now there's not to say that there's not systemic antimicrobials being used, you know, pills or, um, liquids. But I think we, I, I feel like I have seen a sh- culture shift in terms of treating skin infections, that there's more use of what can we do on the skin. Um, the veterinary dermatologists have really been pushing that and then that's you know, trickling down to private practices. Um, and so that's, that's a huge, a huge, huge change. And, you know, an increased emphasis on, well, what's the 
underlying. And, you know, in the intervening years since those guidelines, we've had new and new therapeutics. So we had drugs that actually control the itch better and that are more, you know, rather than so that especially here in the Southeast, we see a lot of atopic dermatitis, like all so many of our patients are itchy um, and we just have much better drugs to treat itch. So if we're treating the itch, even if we don't know, again, some of these drugs treat multiple kinds. So whether it's you're allergic to trees or dust mites or your food or whatever, it still hits that itch pathway. And so if we can deal with that, then we're, we're doing better. Um, so I think it's kind of been multiple things in terms of, of skin. And also um, there's been more the the idea of the microbiome and probiotics and that has really started to become I think within our you know the culture people are used to thinking about it for themselves and so when we talk about saying the side effects of drugs on the microbiome or what it does to the you know the bacteria in your gut um, because that's something that's more I don't know if you want to use the word trendy, but it's on trend. It's something that is more common for people to talk about. That might not have been something that we could have used as a discussion point in the past, but now we can. Um, and the power of bike, you know, probiotics or yeah, diet changes to impact um, common conditions like diarrhea. So I think we're yeah. making progress. I agree with Jen. I think we have a long way to go, um, but I do think we, we're making progress and things, are, it's just, it's, things are slow to change. And that's, um, that's typical of anything, not just antibiotic use, <laughs> but any sure. new, any new knowledge or, or innovation change within medicine is just slow. <laughs> yeah. I, but I think that what you said, Aaron, about the microbiome is really, really important because, you know, I think, you know, Time Time Magazine has like featured the microbiome. <laughs> um, you know, we, not that anyone's watching regular TV anymore and not just streaming and everything, but like, <laughs> you know, if you do watch regular TV, there are, you know, commercials for, you know, yogurt and, you know, the, the you know, how great this yogurt is because it's got all these live active cultures. And um, so I think there's, there's the advantage of that shared vocabulary and language with um, pet owners now that veterinarians can tap into to make these conversations easier and to um, help them understand, you know, why we want to use antibiotics only when needed and only for the duration needed because we want to protect that microbiome, which is so important for like whole body health. You know, the other thing I don't think folks think about a lot is that when we treat, you know, Aaron mentioned the use of topical um, antimicrobials and topical treatments. It's really important because when we use systemic drugs and, you know, we're, we're, we're basically sort of increasing that population of resistant organisms in the gut, you know, we're kind of giving them an advantage when we get rid of all their friends that are susceptible to the drug. So even if we're not treating something in the gut, we're treating something in the skin, you know, it's affecting that population in the gut. And that tends to be a really important reservoir for, future resistant infections like UTIs, for example. Yeah, those are all such great points. And um, I do, I've seen the same trends myself, like even just since graduation, um, just how often, I remember the very first day that I worked as a vet in private practice, you know, I didn't do an internship, I came straight out of school, started at an AHA practice. And the very first day, they showed me where the ear medications were and the cephalexin, you know, the like, massive <laughs> bottle of cephalexin, you know, and they were like, it was June in upstate New York. And they were like, you're gonna be using a lot of these things. And I did. And, you know, the first day, like I had to calculate doses of cephalexin because I'd never done that before. Because why would we learn anything <laughs> easy like that in school, right? And um, I, and, you know, that sets a tone for how you're going to practice the rest of your life, how you learn at that first job, that first week, you know. But I have definitely seen a trend with people using more topicals. And they've made topicals cooler, too. Like, you know, you know, you see, yeah. like, people trying to make the packaging easier and the products look more appealing and they smell better. It's not just like dumping chlorhexidine in a 
in a bucket, you know, and um, and I love that. Like <laughs> or I love the, the sulfur containing shampoos. Oh yeah, <laughs> what's their yeah. dog to smell like sulfur? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, people are. I think companies have really caught on to the fact that people aren't going to use the stuff no matter how well it works unless they try to make it a little bit mm-hmm. more user friendly, which is a huge issue with topicals, yeah. obviously. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah. But you know, I I yeah, was now ask- there's like sprays and. Yeah, like oh, mousses. Yeah, like sprays and mousses, things that make it like really easy and yeah, like Yeah, they smell I mean, nice. I have I have wipes like chlorhexidine wipes for my dog yeah. at home when she gets like her chin, she has atopic dermatitis, but she gets like these nasty like pustules the, on her chin. Exactly. I just like wipe it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give her her magical anti-itch injection, wipe up her yeah, her yeah. acne. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> it's easy and uh, you know, veterinarians, like, if you can't treat your own pet That's easily, right. Right? I mean, I feel like we are the best and worst pet owners. So, like, if it's something that we're 100%. willing to do, then you know it's it's a good yeah. it's a good product. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I feel like the moose, the mooses especially, like the clients seem to really like those because they last a long time, and you know they're kind of like fun to use, and it's like a little massage, you know, for your dog or whatever. But I. You know, there's obviously still a lot of people that come in and just want the pills. Um, they're like, I'm not going to do that. and Or they don't believe you that it's going to work. And so this leads me into my next question. I was actually going to ask you what you see as the biggest obstacles um, to, you know, all of us being good stewards of these drugs. But actually, I think that's really the same thing as what I was going to go into next, which is these common objections that we hear from colleagues, from coworkers, and from clients. And I thought maybe we could just start addressing some of those common ones, and um, and that would cover a lot of the reasons why people maybe don't do this every case, every time. So mm-hmm. um, the first one, this one, like I, I this is my biggest one, I think, especially for newer graduates, um, you know, people who are newer to the field or new to a practice, and it's that clients often are expecting you to prescribe oral antibiotics. And even if they kind of understand why that's it's important to be good stewards, they'll say, well, can't you just do it this one time? Like I'm going on a trip or my you know, son is sick or I have this really busy week at work. And we're worried that if we don't do what they're asking, they'll go someplace else, they'll leave a bad review, um, or even they won't follow up with us because so many people don't and they'll sue us if the pet doesn't get better or take us to the board. And these are not like crazy possibilities. So how do you feel like the best way is for people to address that concern? Yeah, it's, it's tricky. And that's, it's real. I think we, we can all say we've been in the room um, or um, I think one of the things we talked about in another conversation was, maybe not everybody at your practice does it the same way. Um, And so you might be called upon to, oh, well, Dr. So-and-so always gives, to your point, cephalexin. Like Mrs. Jones calls in and whenever (laughs) Fluffy has a rash, then, then, you know, then Dr. So-and-so gives, you know, know, 30 cephalexin and, you know, two weeks of prednisone or something like that. Um, Yeah. So it's it's hard. And I think that, um, I think of it like, any other difficult conversation, right? So we have the tools. We, we use these tools when we talk about money, we use these tools when we talk about convenience euthanasia. So some of the same things that work in those conversations can work here. And one of that is being very clear. Um, there is a term that there's a great paper in human medicine that talks about it's what's called foreshadowing. And we already know that when we describe what we're doing in our physical exam, that clients take value from that. So like side benefit to that is if we are foreshadowing what we're going to get to at the end, for example, if, um, again, we'll use Fluffy, Fluffy comes in with a cough. And if I'm saying, yes, I can, I can hear today that she has a cough, but I'm listening to her lungs and her lungs sound clear. Oh, good news. She doesn't have a fever today. Oh, I'm checking. List, she's not dehydrated. That's great. Oh, you're telling me that she's eating and drinking okay at home. Fluffy's running around the room. Look how excited she is to be here today. All of those things, as you describe, doing your normal physical exam, your discussion about history, you sort of set the situation for saying at the end, hey, because of all of these things, 
Fluffy doesn't need an antibiotic today. Yes, she's got a cough, but she doesn't have a fever. Otherwise, she's feeling it well. And for most dogs, uh, you know, with these signs at her age, they do really well and the cough goes away on its own. Let me make some other recommendations for how you can help Fluffy at home. You know, inc- making sure she's rested, making sure she gets water intake. And um, uh, Jen's college, University of Minnesota, has a really great, um, it's called the non-prescription, um, it was called non-prescription pad, Jen, where Not, are you? Yeah, non-antibiotic prescription, prescription pad. pad. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Oh my God, yeah. that's amazing. So I... <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's, it's fun. It's on our website. It's the An- Antimicrobial Resistance and Stewardship Initiative website, arsi.umn.edu. And it's, yeah, it's got a bunch of re- clinical resources, including this. And, and the whole point of that, it's based upon like the viral prescription pad in humans where yep. there was this recognition, there was like way too much antibiotic prescribing for upper respiratory infections that were viral primarily that weren't complicated by a bacterial infection and then just get better on their own. Yeah, they're annoying. But what the the idea there is not just withholding antibiotics, right? That feels negative. It's mm-hmm. it's providing positive action. So like this, the, the, our, ours, um, our, our document, which you can download and like totally change and put, you know, your clinic logo on or whatever, if you want to use it, but it, it's like good news, <laughs> you know, great news. Your pet does not need an antibiotic. And like, if someone told me that, I'd be like, oh my gosh. So I don't have to remember to give this twice a day. I don't have to chase my cat around the house and basically sit on it to shove a pill down its throat. Like it's amazing. Yay. <laughs> um, no, no antibiotics. Um, but in, in, and in, and it explains, you know, that, you know, a lot of these conditions will, improve on their own and and that we just need to provide some supportive care in it and it it allows you to kind of fill in what are the what are the actions or supportive care things that you're either going to prescribe or tell the owner to do at home so like the upper respiratory infection example you know put the cat in the bathroom when you're taking a shower humidify the air you know warm up the food so that they can smell it better because their nose is stuffy um and then also, you know, when when should you be concerned? So like, you know, when to notify us if things aren't improving by or what things you should look out for. So it's it's um, providing positive things for the, the client to do so that they're helping their pet because they came to you because they want to help their pet, right? So right. it's allowing them to do that. It's, it's communicating that you're both on the same page. Like your goal is helping the pet too, yeah. you know, which helps to, to um, bond the client to you and to your clinic and um, provides, you know, a if then sort of scenario too. So like if, you know, if your cat's you know, still stops eating well or is still snotty in a, in a week or, or whatever um, your parameters are, then, you know, we have a plan, come back in or we'll, we, at that point, it would be appropriate to prescribe an antibiotic. So I think, um, I think providing positive treatment actions, even if they're not antibiotics, I think is helpful. Erin gave the example of, you know, probiotics and, and diet, you know, so for those acute diarrheas that come in and they routinely get metronidazole, I mean, there's pretty good evidence there out there now that says metronidazole can actually cause more dysbiosis. And so, you know, if our goal is to protect that and, and microbiome and sort of put it right again, then, then you know, I think um, providing things that the owners can do rather than them just leaving without anything. You know, I think that's yeah. where they yep. would leave the bad Yelp review or go yeah. down the street for alternative therapy. I, th- um, but uh, so it, it, you know, it's a lot of client communication, right? Yeah. Um, like everything, but right? it, it's not, yeah, but yeah. it's really not just about withholding antibiotics, right? right. It's, it's, it's about, it's about what should we be doing for the animal? And there's lots of things that we can do. Yeah. Yeah. That I, watchful one waiting. Of, I mentioned before I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mentioned I did do some research on antimicrobial stewardship. And so one of the things I did last, uh, last year and the paper is coming out sometime soon um, <clears throat> was to look at focus groups and ask them about use. And one of the things that the people in our focus groups really honed in on was, 
answer all my questions. <laughs> tell me, tell me why they they need they don't need an antibiotic. Tell me what I should be doing. And then that piece that Jen mentioned is it's really critical to say these are the things to watch for. This is how I will know if it's getting worse or if it might need antibiotics. I'm, I'm saying it, they don't need it today. But I'm not saying they might not need it in 24 hours or 48 hours. So at home, I'd like you to watch for, as Jen mentioned, they're not eating now Um, or they're becoming, you know, they were bouncing around and now they're listless and they're sleeping all day Um, and that you have a plan. So this is where the team comes back in, um, whether it's you are going to call them back or um, Katie, my technician, is going to call you in 24 hours to check on Fluffy and see how things are going or in 48 hours or we'll email you or, you know, if you have an automatic system that texts people and just sends them a text message and and checks in that they can respond. It's really where I think, and we do this in other things, but I think it's really critical here is what are you going to go home and do today? What are you going to look for? And when are we going to talk again? And having that plan set before they leave, because then they're not calling the the tendency for them to call back and get angry is I think less in my experience it's been if you say what they're looking for and say when you should talk again then when they call or they text in they say hey you told me that this might happen well now it has and you told me that if it did we would use antibiotics or we would use this other medication I think it's time for that this is what I'm seeing so it's less, I find it less combative. It's more, you know, giving again, foreshadowing, here's the things to look for. If it happens, then we'll do this. And it gets away from that. I'm not giving you something. It's saying I'm using my clinical judgment to say that it's not needed today, but here's where it might be needed. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't know how it'll go. It might just get better. Funny thing is you mentioned the diarrhea, Jen, and I, I talked to my students about this and I, I say, you know, how many of you have had a pet who's had diarrhea? And of course, almost every single one of them raises their hand. And I say, <laughs> I'm not like, how ask- many of you have had a pet? <laughs> right, <you know>? exactly. <laughs> but then I say, I'm not going to ask you how many of you have had diarrhea, but I'm going to assume that everyone at some point in their life has had diarrhea. Think about what you do. Do you go to the doctor when you have, you know, one episode of diarrhea, no, we, you know, we eat rice or we eat toast or we, you know, drink Gatorade. And so it's just to highlight, there's this little bit of disconnect between what we do personally. You have a cough for a day. You don't go to the doctor and expect to get something. Um, and I also find that we, in practice, I am able to capitalize on what the good work that's been done by our pediatricians, um, because you're, to your point about respiratory, the pediatricians have gotten a lot more um, savvy about having these conversations. And so people with children, when you start to have a conversation about, you know, a cough with no other signs, if an otherwise healthy pet, you know, we're going to just, you know, it, it's oftentimes it will, you know, get better on its own. And we're going to do these other things just like we do with kids. And, the, and the, a lot of times clients will be like, yeah, yep, yeah, that's happened with me. So having that... Um, frame of reference I've found that since the pediatricians have started doing that my conversations about at least for upper respiratories have actually gotten a little bit easier um, because if clients have that sort of shared experience of oh yeah that's what I did with my son or my daughter you know then uh, it's not so new and new to them Um, the concept is something that's familiar so it feels more comfortable and I think that's what it's about it's about us getting more comfortable with it, our team getting more comfortable with it, and our clients, right? So it's, we know more, you know, and really focusing on the pet, I think, as itself is, um, there's been actually some research out of Australia and the UK, and people really don't care, like, so much about these big, like, public health or grand ideas, but they really care about their pet. So if you can bring it back to this, antibiotics are not the right choice for your pet and here's why they don't need them or it's going to upset their stomach or it's going to, you know, these are the potential side effects, then you're relating, even though in your head, maybe that's why you're part of why you're driven to do it. Um, clients really want to know like, wh- what's the best thing for my dog or my cat and what are the, you know, what are the pros and cons of using it? So... I think if you keep it keep it to that animal and the impact on that animal and that client, you're going to get a lot more traction um, in terms of, you know, going away, everybody feeling okay about it. 
The really important thing there is the communication, right? And we talk about that in every episode of this podcast. Like basically veterinary medicine is a communication <laughs> science with some medicine thrown in, right? Like we, without that communication, <laughs> yeah, I, I, we're just not going to be successful at treating hardly anything. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. And <laughs> and I, I think it's also important, like... This is a story that I know, um, you know, we've talked about before, but I wanted to share with our listeners because this was an example of how everybody involved was like just this one time and everybody had the dog's best interests at heart and it just didn't work out well at all. Um, But I saw this dog, we'll call her Eliza, and she was a shepherd mix. She's like a really big dog and she was extremely fearful and we were a fear-free practice. And so, um, you know, we had a policy of like, I called it a no torture policy. You know, we weren't going to like hold anything down with a muzzle on and like do things to it. Right. Which I loved. It just made practice so much nicer for me. But, um, with this dog, what that meant was when she would come in and she'd be so scared, she was having chronic lower urinary tract signs, you know, blood of the urine, accidents in the house, asking to go out all the time. And I saw her, I think, once or twice for this. And the clients were like, yeah, she's had a number of these, you know, and usually with antibiotics, it goes away and then it takes a while and comes back. But she always does really well in the antibiotics. So we just want that again because we don't want to scare her. And, you know, I wasn't going to wrestle this massive scared dog on the x-ray table, but I knew radiographs and a cysto culture were important. You know, I knew it was time, but I didn't do it, you know, at that visit because it was so much money to do those things. And it was, it would require heavy sedation and it would be all day. And like, we were really busy and the owners knew she did well with these antibiotics, like, and then it took a while for the signs to come back. And so I, you know, gave the antibiotics just this one time I think not realizing how many times that had happened and she came back in, her signs came back right away. And I was like, well, I guess we need to do this. So we decided to sedate her, got her radiographs and she was full of, you know, classic full of stones. And, um, actually a colleague was in surgery that day and said, well, I can actually, you know, she's been miserable for so long. I can just do a cystotomy today. And they did the cystotomy um, I was honestly surprised that the owners had consented, but they were they knew she didn't have a choice really at that point. And her bladder was just a disaster. It was it turned out to be full of MRSA. Um, and you know, obviously we didn't have a culture right then, so um, my colleagues sewed her up as best they could and then um, you know, the culture got sent out, came back MRSA and she had not done well. Um, I think she actually dehissed because of how just infected and necrotic and sad her bladder wall was. And I've not forgotten that dog because these colleagues never complained about money and they never said, I don't want to do that. I don't think you're right. They just were scared because they'd had to sedate this dog Mm -hmm. to do what they thought would be a simple diagnostic that she didn't need. And in a multi-doctor practice, we hadn't done a good job of communicating all together what the consequences of that could be and why it was so important to do these tests a lot earlier. And um, I, that case definitely made a huge impact on me and how I saw antibiotics for urinary problems, especially going forward, and especially in younger dogs. Like, she wasn't very old, and um, that didn't need to happen. And, um, you know, It takes one case like that sometimes to really get through to you, and I don't want that case to happen to anybody else. Um, So this is a really, really important issue. And, you know, one thing that didn't come up in that scenario was colleague was my um, my colleagues criticizing me for doing those tests, because at that point it was clear, right? Like it was way past the time to do those tests. But I've been in practices where. Uh, there was this doctor, maybe a doctor who'd been practicing longer than me, who would have been like, oh, I wouldn't have done a cysto right then. Or like, why do we sedate this dog to do this test when, you know, the owner just needs something now and so much money. And it can be really intimidating, especially for a newer veterinarian or a technician who mm-hmm. knows better. And they're working with a clinician who insists on doing things a certain way. Um, and that to me is a huge obstacle 
do you have any comments on those situations, like how we can navigate conflicts within the practice about how colleagues might be viewing this? Yeah, that's that's a tough one. And I, I, I know I've worked with people, I know I hear friends who've worked with people where you just, and I think that's just a part of practice, right? We all have a, a part of why we go into it is you have your, your autonomy um, and to a certain extent, you know, you know the patient that, you know, you have the patient in front of you, nobody else does. And so having some variability amongst what people do is just a natural fact of, of practice. Um, and I think that a couple things, one is sometimes people don't know what other people are doing. So, um, and that can be a, you know, that can be not just for this, right? That can be a culture of a practice. Some practices yeah. are great and they have rounds and they talk about tough cases and they talk about, well, what do we do? How do you treat this kind of case? And that can be kind of sort of the practice culture and others don't. Um, I've worked as a relief veterinarian and, um, you know, when I, I'll see a case and the tech, so then I'll, ask the technician what drugs do we have or that kind of thing and they'll say well you know this doctor does it this way or this doctor does it that way so I think that's just the natural part to be doing things differently and I go back again to a statement I mentioned earlier which is having aha guidelines has helped me so many times um, as a as in as a new doctor as an associate because if you have this kind of a conflict where somebody's maybe doing it differently and it's, you know, your word versus someone else bringing in this sort of third party guidelines and saying, well, you know, he, here's the recommendation. Here's the standard of care um, of, that has, that's, you know, this is an outside third party <laughs> and, be, you know, being able to bring that in and use that on your, to your side and saying, well, the, you know, the standard of care is I should be taking x-rays and doing, you know, a cysto to be able to get a urine and see what's going on. Um, I think that can help. Um, I think that can help in that situation. What do you think, Jen? Yeah, I a hundred percent agree. I think there's so much complicated like emotions in those situations. And, you know, folks have done studies on stewardship and barriers to stewardship on, on, in the human healthcare side and all of these things play into it. It's not just like what your knowledge is, um, but it's your years of experience. It's the, the group that you work with, um, the client expectations. So it's, you know, it's not just, oh, my patient has this problem and this is what I should do. There, there mm -hmm. are so many more things that influence our decision making, but I think guidelines save us all the time. Um, as, as Aaron said, you know, those are standards of care. So, you know, even if you're a new graduate, you worked really hard to get that DVM degree and you don't want it, you know, threatened by, you know, investigation of the, you know, Board of Animal Health, right? But if you stick to what the standard of care is as outlined by available guidelines, then you know that you're doing the right thing. Um, and so like in, in your Eliza uh, scenario, Katie, the you know, f for sporadic urinary tract infections, the guidelines tell us like, sure, you don't have to culture all the time for those, you know, use these empiric drugs for prescribing amoxicillin or TMS. But they do also clearly say that if there are recurrent urinary tract infections, that's when the um, more diagnostics are warranted. And so um, I think using those as your backup is is really helpful. And I, I also just, you know, I feel like evidence are, are vet, veterinarians are tend to be really evidence-based. So if you if you provide that evidence, you know, we, we know that if you're just, you know, talking to your aunt and you tr try to provide evidence for, you know, why are, <laughs> why should you, you know, wear a mask or whatever, you know, it, it that's a harder sell. But when you're talking with, you know, like-minded veterinarians, you know, we, we all, um, you know, learned about evidence-based medicine. The problem in vet med is that a lot of evidence has been missing, but when it's available, you know, provide it. Cause you know, not everybody has time to review the literature every week and the guidelines do a really nice job of distilling a, a lot of the, the newer findings down. And, um, and I, I think, you know, providing that to your colleagues, getting um, consensus among among colleagues about, you know, what are we going to do in these different situations, mm -hmm. um, getting the care team involved, because, you know, it may be a different doctor seeing a patient every time, but, you know, maybe it's the same technician That's who right. could speak up and say, oh, you know, this dog was just in two weeks ago for this problem and two weeks before that. Um, 
I, I think that can help. The other thing about getting consensus among practitioners is that really goes a long way to decreasing frustration from pet owners mm-hmm. um, because it is it is um, mm-hmm. it, it is hard to you know have well so and so doctor gave me this last time and I I just want to do that again it, it's hard to um, it's tar- it's a lot more conversation right to to change the the tactics. Um, but if, if you, you know, all have consensus based upon good, um, you know, standard of care guidelines, that makes it a lot, a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to like highlight the one thing you said, which is about the technician. And I, I mean, we're, we've, I think you mentioned it before, Katie, that just the team, right? You're, um, so, so many times, um, it's, it could be, it could be a kennel staff, it could be a a tech, it could be a receptionist who has a a relationship with this client and, or with that animal based on their own interactions, which are, you know, separate from yours. And they really, like, we should really celebrate their passion and the way that they advocate. They, you know, I will have, I have had that situation many times where the technician will come to me um, because they really care about a certain patient and like, oh my gosh, they have this again. And then you're like, okay, tell me more about that. Well, it has been like, this is the third time and, oh, it's really, cha- you know, and they, they are the, um, again, the, the, the team is a lot of times the continuity over time and then really the ones who are seeing things over and over uh, that re- I would welcome a team member to to share that with me if they have this insight that maybe I don't have because I'm in a big doctor practice and patients are you know between different different clients um again that's a little bit of culture too um and I think that's one great thing about AHA in general is just celebrating teams that is sort of in the nature of the culture of AHA to celebrate teams and to encourage involvement um uh, you know, an empowerment of the team. So I feel like that's, you know, a bonus, a plus to our, yeah. to our hospitals. Uh, yeah. A hundred percent. I feel like medicine is a team sport. Yep. And if you're, yeah. if you're doing it alone, um, you're, you're probably not having the best experience and your patients may not be either. Yeah. And your team isn't either. And so right now, every, yeah. right. everybody's having a hard <laughs> time finding and holding on to team members. Like, one of the best ways to find and keep really good people is to get them involved. Like that's why they're doing this. There's so many easier ways to earn money, you know, and earn more money probably. So, um, I, I, I love that you said that, like, I did not, I just want everyone listening to know that I did not pay them to talk about AHA as a champion of the team. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but I love that because that is such a huge part of our message now. And like the entire, you know, everything that we do, I want that to be empowering for the team and for leadership to say, mm-hmm. I can give my team more responsibility and trust them to speak up and advocate for our patients because that's why we're all here. Um, so thank you for that, <laughs> Aaron. Um, but I, <laughs> I, you know, we, there's so many other aspects of this that we could talk about and I don't want to keep you here forever, but you know, we could talk about like, like the culture, you know, maybe you don't have to do a urine culture every time, but um, when you do do it, it can cost a lot. And like, if you're doing, if we're trying to do diagnostic tests on more patients to, really justify when we do need to use antimicrobials and decide what those antimicrobials should be, then maybe we can find a way to make them a little bit more affordable for the average client. Would you say that that's realistic to think about? You know, maybe quantity will let us be a little bit more flexible with how we can price these tests so that other, so that clients can afford them. Cause I know vet care is really expensive for a lot of people. Yes, I think it's I think it's both. I think uh, I, I know a number of commercial labs do give sort of a quant- quantity discount. So mm-hmm. if you, they'll give you pri- a pricing off. If you do a lot of a certain thing, then you get a you get your the price to you is less. Um, and uh, and to your point about when you come to a client to say this is a situation where we re- this is the third urinary tract infection they've had in six months. We definitely need to. And then, you know, one of those things is, is a urine culture or to the skin issue. 
we've treated the skin and it's not getting any better. Now is the time to, you know, we've exhausted these other things. Let's, let's look at that. But I would also say on top of that is that there are a lot of diagnostics that are not that expensive and that can be done in the hospital and really can give you a better sense of whether this is something that needs to be treated. I am a huge fan of cytology for everything. Um, a, a slide and a cotton tip swab or a piece of double stick tape can really tell you a whole lot and really help you actually can help you in that conversation as well. So doing an ear cytology, doing a skin swab or a tape prep um, and staining that. And, you know, if you have a situation where you, you do that and you see inflammatory cells, but you don't see any bacteria or maybe, oh, I see yeast and I don't see bacteria, then you can, you can it, confidently come into the room and say to the client, we checked and we don't see any bacteria or we only see a small number. And that's normal because back to, we know back a little bit of bacteria and yeast live on our skin. Um, the other one that tests that's, I think, very much um, underutilized is... Um, People commonly do a urinalysis, um, but you doing a dry mount urine cytology. So once you spin down your urine, um, people are used to putting a little drop, you know, on the slide and doing a wet mount. Well, you can take one drop and spread it like a blood smear, dry it out and stain it. And all of a sudden, now you're not looking at that wet mount and seeing, well, is that just movement or is that bacteria? Or what kind of bacteria? If you do the dry mount, and there's plenty of, you just have to Google dry mount urine cytology. There's plenty of uh, pictures and how to's all over the place. Um, but you can really then see, like you can actually see the neutrophils and you can see if you have rod shaped or, or cocci shaped bacteria. And then to be able to say to someone, yes, you know, they, they have urinary tract signs. I see bacteria and they're to Jen's point, the, the, in the guidelines, we have amoxicillin and trimethoprim sulfa. Well, do I have rods? Do I have cocci? So you can not only uh, decide whether you have bacteria and an, you know, an infection, you have inflammatory cells in there, but what kind in sort of in general, we know that usually our cocci commonly have staph. That's the most common. And then on the rod side, E. coli, or maybe Klebsiella. So you can actually make a better empiric judgment about what to use eat just based on that really simple test. You can rule out other things really inexpensively. Um, a fecal direct or a fecal float. Maybe you do a flea comb and figure out it's flea allergic dermatitis. Maybe you do a snap test or some kind of in-house test for some of the other things like parvo or giardia. Um, none of those are, I mean, I would say that the cheapest one is going to be just your cytology. Um, and that hopefully for most, you know, not all people, but hopefully for most people, that's well within the range of what they can afford. And it can really shape both your diet treatments, but also then your confidence and, and then how you're approaching that, that conversation with the client, whether you can say, I'm seeing bacteria or I'm not seeing bacteria, I'm seeing signs of infection or infl inflammatory cells or not, um, you have evidence there to, to really say something about their pet. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I'm definitely a cytology cheerleader. <laughs> it's, plus, it's fun. <laughs> it, it does get fun, right? Like, it, it's scary when you're first starting because you don't know what you're looking at. But, like, the more you do it, the more fun it is, I think. And the more fun for your technicians to do, too, because um, they're perfectly capable of reading yes. cytologies. And a lot of them really, really enjoy it. Yeah. I was just about to say that. Like, here's a way that you can the team can get really involved and you can, how many times have you walked in a room and the technician says, Mrs. Jones is a room two and I've already got the ear swab and I can tell you on the cytology that I see, you know, this. So in a, you know, well-oiled team, <laughs> in a well-oiled team, they already know that you want to get the cytology. They get in, take the history, get the cytology. And by the time you're walking in the room, you already have that information to put together then with your physical exam. So, yeah. Um, I think everybody wins in that situation. Absolutely. And it feels more, um, you know, you have a certain amount of oomph behind you then um, in any of your decisions, which yes. makes you feel a little bit less vulnerable. It's like what the client's going to say, what your colleagues yep. might say, what, you know, even if all of that stuff is not going as well as you hope it will, you can at least know that you're doing best by that patient. And that is ultimately so it's just mm -hmm. important for our peace of mind so um yeah big fan of cytology too i don't know if, if if you guys follow ashley bourgeois the germ vet um 
on Instagram. She has a podcast too. And she's, she has a hashtag. She uses all the time, psychology, everything. And so she's always <laughs> posting pictures of psychology. <laughs> and, um, she uses a toothpick to get inside like the nail beds, you know, and like pull out all the little yeasties. Oh, nice. And, uh, uh-huh. So it's a, it's like, Oh a, my gosh. I love dermatologists. Yeah. It's like a derm nerd. <laughs> We're so enthusiastic. Paradise. Yes. So um, anyway, if you're, yeah. if you're a psychology fan, go, go follow Ashley. But um, you know, the, yeah, the two of you I, I are that's... just so passionate about this. I love it so much. <laughs> I was I was going to say, you know, like we surveyed veterinarians in Minnesota and asked about, you know, this issue of prescribing antibiotics when there's diagnostic uncertainty. And I think, you know, it, it's like a you got to weigh the balance, right? There's like, wh- what what are the consequences if I, if the patient has an infection and I don't treat with an antibiotic? What are the consequences if they doesn't have an infection and I do treat with an antibiotic? And I think like most veterinarians feel more comfortable prescribing in the face of that diagnostic uncertainty. And cytology is such like an easy, quick and powerful tool to help reduce some of that uncertainty so that you feel confident not prescribing or confident that when you prescribe, you're doing the right thing. Um, so yeah, I, I just, I'm with all the derm nerds and the psychology. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think a point, a point that we, I think we've kind of danced around, but maybe not focused on is the importance of figuring out what the underlying condition is. And yeah, to your point about the dog with the stones is that dog had an underlying condition that was the, the, you know, that was not being addressed. And that's the same thing with these dogs that over and over are coming back with skin issues is they, you know, they have an underlying condition. And so um, some of the other thing we kind of circle, in the loop all the way back to preventive care. This is why we vaccinate animals. This is why we do senior, you know, you know, middle aged to older, you know, lab work is part of our, um, you know, part of our package of things that we do when they come in for their wellness uh, checks. Uh, we're, we want to make sure that we're not just band-aiding what's happening, you know, as an end result of thing, but what, what's, why, you know, does this dog have uh, hypothyroidism or would, that's undiagnosed? Do we have atopic dermatitis? Maybe this dog has uh, a sensitivity to a certain ingredient in the food. Um, if we can kind of back this back up a few steps to what is the thing that's going on with this animal that puts them in a position of over and over again having that that situation that's really what we want to address and so to your point about uh, what uh, the cost of diagnostics is that's another thing to say is like well one way or the other (laughs) we're going to spend money and I think the best way that you could spend your money is really getting to the bottom of what's going on here because my ultimate goal is that we try to fix the thing and so you're not coming back over and over again and we're 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 figuring out the root cause and that's really where we need to spend our money right now so that we can figure out what's going on with Fluffy so that you don't have to come back yeah Um, for sure doing diagnostics um earlier can definitely be cost saving mm-hmm. and and comfort saving right yes. yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah yeah and and it's yeah. not like we don't know what's going to happen you know it's not like we can be like well maybe just this once the dog who's been in four times a year with you know <laughs> this pyoderma is not going to come in four times next year like it's going to come in potentially six <laughs> right. times or eight times and or maybe mm-hmm. next week and we know that as clinicians as technicians we we've watched all of this over and over again you know the front office staff i know is like yes please find out what's wrong so that we don't have to deal with mrs smith <laughs> calling like 600 times wanting antibiotics and then having to tell her no um it's it affects the whole right. team's mental health as well to practice mm-hmm. this this way so yeah. Um, well, it- and I think the thing we uh, we say sometimes is um, like you mentioned, like this is can be different is to say we know more now, you yeah. know, great, you know, congratulations. Since last time we saw you, we know more now. And that can be the guidelines are out or, you know, in the case of a young dog where we're not sure if they have a seasonal allergy or um, a food sensitivity now that we've seen them this many times, a pattern is emerging, right? So, you know, this pattern, you know, suggests to us that we should 
look more into allergies or look more into food. And we didn't, we couldn't really know that the last couple of times because we, they hadn't been in. It was that, you know, we didn't know enough about them and their, and the, what was happening. But now we have all of these visits and these, this, you know, this information that you brought us about, she always is itchy in, you know, in March. Okay, well, let's do something with that information. We now, yeah. now we know more. Now there's more we can do. So Sometimes rather than like, we were wrong and now we, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's not that we were wrong. It's just, we didn't, we didn't have the information. That's the new research, the new guidelines, the new clinical signs. Um, all of that is new information. So really making it a positive. Now that we know more, this is what, you know, this is what I would recommend today for you. I love that. Sometimes time is a diagnostic too, right? <laughs> um, yep. So you both are fantastic and have so much great stuff to say. And I just love your passion for this topic. And I hope people will, will listen to this and then share it with their teammates, um, no matter what their role, because really you've outlined so many ways that everybody on the veterinary team, no matter what their role, uh, can affect our future with antimicrobials. I mean, antibiotics, we're helping them, but we're helping us just as much by thinking this way. And it's small changes mm-hmm. over time, over and over again, that are going to make the difference. So um, thank you so much mm-hmm. to both of you for sharing your wisdom and enthusiasm today. Um, and thank you also for contributing to the guidelines, because uh, that is a fantastic piece of work. And I think it's <laughs> going to get a lot of use in the next however many years until it's updated again. So Really appreciate that. Thanks, Katie. And Thanks, Katie. This is great. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, and to those of you listening, don't forget to check out the guidelines. Um, the 2022 AAFP AHA Antimicrobial Stewardship Guidelines are live now. They're free to download or look at online. Um, and you can. There's also a really fun infographic that is also an animated video that you can download and give your clients or show your team. And it's all at aha.org slash antimicrobials. So be sure to check that out. Thanks to both of you again, Dr. Jennifer Granick, Dr. Aaron Fry for joining us today. And thanks to all of you for listening. And we'll catch you next time on Central Line. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Central Line, the AHA podcast. If you love what you hear, please take a moment to leave us a rating and review. For more resources to help you simplify your journey towards excellence in veterinary medicine, we invite you to visit aha.org. That's A-A-H-A dot O-R-G.